It is now my pleasure to welcome Beth Knox, Seafair President and CEO, to the podium, who will moderate today's program. Before I do, to inform the introduction, I reached out to her friend and Seafair predecessor, Beth Wojcik. Her response was comprehensively impressive. Best captured by the quote, her feet get incredibly sore this time of year. While we've been sipping a cocktail at the after party, Beth has produced the Rock and Roll Marathon, Seattle's 4th of July celebration, which by the way, she helped save, 17 parades, including last Saturday's torchlight parade for 300,000 spectators, and enter Fleet Week with the Hydros and the Blue Angels. For those of you who are still not yet in awe, Beth's legacy includes orchestrating the historic Seahawks Super Bowl parade. Along with pulling off zillions of events that make Seafair named one of the U.S. top 10 festivals, she has been named a woman of influence by Puget Sound Business Journal and serves on boards with the Seattle Sports Commission and the Seattle Police Foundation. I personally was intrigued to learn that Beth loves theater, thinks she can sing, and Bernie, she is a big fan of the Fifth Avenue and currently exploring her options. So note, this is Beth's last seafare as she steps down after 10 years. She has no doubt earned a break and some quality time with her two twin high school seniors. Please join me in recognizing Beth for her investment in our club and in our community. Thank you. I will clarify that while I like to sing, it doesn't mean I can sing well. But my dad used to always say, if you can't sing well, sing with enthusiasm, right? So we have a really fun program here today, today and I am so pleased to be moderating this. Uh, the, our, our theme or our topic for this panel is uh, women in leadership roles, and uh, specifically in high profile roles. Uh, so I'd like to now introduce to the stage Captain Katie Higgins, U.S. Marine pilot with the Blue Angels. She's based out of Pensacola, and she is uh, the first female pilot in the team's 69-year history. <laughs> and next, we have Captain Susanna Darcy Henneman, also known as Seafair Queen Elcyon. Uh, and she is a recently retired chief pilot for Boeing and also Boeing's first female test pilot. And then we also have Vice Admiral Nora Tyson, Commander, U.S. Third Fleet, Admiral Tyson says she didn't do it. We're gonna just keep moving on here. Uh, and, uh, excuse me, Commander U.S. Third Fleet and the first woman to command a fleet in the Pacific area of responsibility. Okay, go ahead. All right, I've been told we're gonna keep going here, so disregard. I'm sure, okay, Chief Scoggins, you let us know if we really need to get the heck out of here. <laughs> okay, we're gonna talk over this. So what I'd like to do here today is, I, there's, I wanted just to highlight the, uh, the synergy and connection between Seafair, Boeing, and Navy. And there's a lot of them, actually. Uh, there's a very strong thread that's woven between these three organization, organizations. Boeing has had a, a steadfast commitment to connecting and supporting people, businesses, and communities on a local and global level. They've been a sponsor of Seafair since the festival's inception, and currently sponsors the Seafair Foundation's community events program. Those are all of our community parades and neighborhood celebrations. They also sponsor Seafair Fleet Week and the Seafair Air Show. They provide equipment, capabilities, and services to our nation's military, including the F-A-18s flown by the Blue Angels. 
Now, outside of the Navy's critical role in protecting our country, it also understands the value of engaging with our community, as well as our businesses here. Whether supporting opportunities for military personnel to be part of the community and to engage with all of us, or making the, those immense vessels out there that protect our global waters accessible to each of the uh, citizens here in this area. But also collaborating with our local emergency management agencies to provide resources and support in, an event, uh, in the event of a nat national, national disaster. Now, meanwhile, there's Seafair. Seafair serves as a conduit to showcase our nation's military through the spectacular Blue Angels performances, as well as the Fleet Week tours. It offers free admission to all active and retired military to the Seafair Weekend Festival. And it con connects businesses, like for instance, the Washington Athletic Club, with the opportunity to host some of the visiting sailors with the WAC members for a family hosting program. So there's a lot of connections here, and I have a few questions that I wanted to ask each of our panelists uh, so that they can showcase a little more in depth uh, where those connections come out. So my first question is, uh, and we'll start with you, Admiral, uh, why do you think community engagement is so important, and what is meaningful about engaging with the Seattle community? Well, uh, thanks, Beth. First of all, I want to say thanks to Sue, to Tom and Diane, to you, to everybody that's a part of this. I won't belabor that. I'll say thank you many times this week. But I, I think it's critical that we, in the military, both active and retired, connect with our communities. We are the community, and we've got to support each other. You take the Rotary Club, and it's about service. That's what we do. We're all volunteers. We serve our country. And if we're not connected to those communities, those people that we serve, and vice versa, then I don't think we're going to be able to do our job to the best of our ability. Because we depend on the Seattle community to support the, the active duty, the families of the active duty, and without that support, we couldn't do what this nation expects of us. Um, Seattle specifically, as you all are, are very aware, is a very maritime community. That's what we do. We, our Coast Guard counterparts, our Canadian counterparts, our counterparts around the world, what we do is protect the maritime commons and ensure safety and security on the water so that Seattle and other communities like Seattle around the world can continue to thrive and have the, uh, the economy that it does for one thing. And then, of course, you know, it's just about global security and ensuring that um, the world is a safe place for our children and our children's children. So thanks, Beth. Thank you. Susanna, can you answer the same question from the perspective of Boeing and certainly from uh, serving as our Queen Elcyon this year and seeing the community from the other side of it? Well, I'll start with the Queen Elcyon piece. One of the things I have been amazed at, um, because typically I, was, I traveled a lot for my job, to see the diversity of our community and how on a small scale for friends and family community weaves us together, but on a large scale, it's what really brings Seattle together and makes us such an awesome city. I think for uh, when I worked for the Boeing Company, a great example of it's small, but it says it all, of where Boeing was committed to community is that Boeing Field is the eighth busiest airport in the United States in the summertime. And typically, I will say we had the biggest airplane kind of on the airport. Uh, but when we rolled out of our parking stall, we got in line with everyone else. Uh, we were offered cuts sometimes, uh, even though we were gulping the most gas per minute, probably more than everyone else on the field. We lined up and we waited our turn because community is really, really important. Great. Thank you. Captain Higgins, how about from the Navy slash Blue Angels perspective? 
Well, again, thanks for having me. Definitely uh, love Seattle. It's my first time here, so thank you for welcoming to your, to your city. It's wonderful. Um, I would say it's definitely important to stay involved with the community, especially through the Blue Angels perspective, is, um, especially right now when the war against ISIS is not on your TV every day. You know, in the early 2000s, especially, I, I mean, <laughs> I'm not trying to make anyone feel old, but I was, uh, to, September 11th happened when I was in high school. Um, so I, being able to have those images dominated on the television really brought uh, our servicemen and women who were serving overseas to the forefront. It brought them to everybody's living room. And now I think a lot of times uh, people forget because those images aren't dominating our living rooms anymore and they forget about those Marines, they forget about the sailors, Coast Guard, Air Forcemen, you know, they forget about everybody who's overseas right now fighting ISIS. They're still keeping us safe. They're still standing the watch in the Pacific Theater. They're still standing the watch in the European Theater. They're still keeping us safe and letting us have the ability to perform, you know, these air shows everywhere throughout the country. They give us the security to be able to have a large group like this without uh, being fear of, you know, a, a bomb threat or something like that. So being a blue angel and being able to infiltrate the community and be able to be a conduit to those servicemen and women that are still over there, the, the actual heroes, you know, I'm, I get to wear the pretty suit. But I'm not the heroes, they are. And to be able to bring that attention back to every community is definitely important. Um, as far as Seattle goes, I think uh, a link with this community would definitely be Boeing. You know, those um, F-18s over there, they are getting older, but because of the product that Boeing produced, they're still able to go over there and drop bombs on enemies, you know, take the fight overseas so that we're not fighting it here. And so Boeing can, and the community can take pride in that you are giving these warfighters high quality products and they're over there protecting us. So be proud of your product, be proud of your community and, and yeah, that's what I think. <laughs> that's great, thank you for that. All right, so here's a fun one. From your individual field of expertise, what is one really cool thing that you can share with the Rotarians that they should know about or look for or experience during Seafair? Now, you know, all different perspectives, of course, but give us a little insight in what they should experience. Admiral? That is simple. Everybody needs to take every opportunity to get to personally chat with as many sailors, Marines, Coast Guardsmen as you possibly can and, and hear their story and share your story with them because we all came from the same place. We all grew up somewhere. For me, I speak the same language Charlie Ray does. I grew up in Tennessee, but somehow ended up uh, where I am today and have had incredible adventures and opportunities and our young men and women who have volunteered to serve this nation and Canada, um, get to know them. They're great people. They serve our country. As Katie said, we are here representing those folks who are downrange fighting the fight every day. So please take every opportunity that you can this week to hear about what they do. They're very proud of what they do. Um, so that, to me, is the coolest thing you can do this week. Thank you. Queen Elsian. I would agree with Vice Admiral Nora, is take any opportunity to participate in any event from the small scale to the really large scale because we have an amazing city and I think, you know, whatever's yours, you can, we can all take for granted a little bit. But um, the people that come out, the kids, uh, the kids have been probably the best part in every event. Uh, the torchlight parade, I didn't realize how beautiful it was and what kind of talent marched in the torchlight parade. And of course, this weekend for a former test pilot who still loves speed, the hydroplane races in the Sound of Freedom and those F-18s and Fat Albert, how can you go wrong? <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Katie? 
Uh, well, I think the show this year is going to be really cool. I've heard in years past, due to the cloud decks and things like that, we haven't been able to do our high show. Um, so this year, I think the weather is going to cooperate with us. You'll see the full high show. Additionally, um, this is about a third-year boss. So uh, the flight lead for our squadron is a third-year boss. That means he's really experienced. He's flown the show site before. So I think things will be a little bit lower, probably a little bit faster than you've seen before. So the show is actually going to be really, really high quality for everybody out here, I think. Um, and then just just as a side note, because they finally have a girl on the team that's a pilot, Taylor Swift is in the music, so there's going to be some. <laughs> so there'll be, I, I think the Fat Albert music is awesome, so you guys will enjoy that, so yeah. <laughs> that's great. Well, I think I may already know the answer to my next question then from you, Katie, but uh, I'd like to turn a little bit more on the personal side and have you talk uh, about how has your work environment evolved and changed over the past five to ten years uh, as you have been coming into this current role? You're asking me about the past five to ten years <laughs> in my current role? Yes. I've been in this role for three days. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think talk more about the work environment. What's been the evolution in the last five to ten years for you personally? Well, um, as I was talking to Admiral Hayward earlier, who was the CNO when I joined the Navy, um, things have changed incredibly, and I won't, I won't talk specifically to the past five to ten years, but for me, when I came in the Navy, the opportunities that exist today for women did not exist. And what I have seen over my now 35-year career, um, it, it's been wonderful. And the law changed at a very um, opportune, fortunate time for me, or I wouldn't be sitting here today. And so the, the, the um, areas within the military in each service that are opening up more each day to women who are qualified to do the job, um, I think has, has been just incredible to watch it and to watch young women like Katie, you know, aspire to those jobs, achieve those jobs, and then be role models for young women coming behind them. And it's just been fun for me to watch. That's great. Susanna, how about you? So in the last five to 10 years, I watched my company go from being, uh, we, we thought we were global, uh, we were worldwide, uh, and going from being worldwide to really global, and being able to connect and to communicate because of um, computers and my beloved and hated Blackberry instantaneously, uh, just with about anyone, anywhere, at any time. So I've, I found it fascinating to all of a sudden, like I said, have like a global look in my job. The last job I had, I had 650 people doing training all around the world. And like I said it was easy to connect with them as opposed to 20 years beforehand, sending a fax was a work of art to somebody that you had out in the field working. Um, what I've probably seen uh, over a trajectory of, I hate to admit, 40 years of a career, um, I started very young, um, is uh, when I was first hired, the other woman that was hired came in right uh, after me. We were known as the blondes, and the only way anybody could keep us straight was she was the tall blonde and I was the short blonde. Um, and now, you know, the last, I'd say, five years when I went anywhere in business, it wasn't anything like that. It was just, oh, here's Susanna, she's here to do a job. And it is such a pleasure along that line to be here with Nora and Katie today, where two fabulous women have been promoted into jobs because they are capable and sharp and they were the best person for the job. Here, here. So maybe a little different perspective for you, Katie, but how would you relate to that? Yeah, it's definitely a different perspective. Uh, Ten years ago, I was a third class at the academy on my summer cruise on a cruiser, so I wasn't even fully commissioned yet. And then uh, five years ago, I didn't even have my wings yet. Um, so I'm definitely very junior in my career. So to, to 
put that in perspective, five to 10 years is, a, is almost half, half my lifetime or a third of my lifetime. Um, <laughs> I, I swear, I'm not trying to make people feel old. I'm just nervous and I just start talking and I should probably stop, but. Um, <laughs> Um, I would say definitely since, um, I, I guess the Blue Angels kind of gave, gave me a perspective. When I joined the military, I just wanted to be one of the guys. You know, I wanted to deploy, I wanted to serve my country, I wanted to be a Marine, I wanted to protect those Marines on the ground. Um, and, and I got that opportunity when I went to Afghanistan back in 2013. And that's all I wanted to do. I just wanted to serve my country. I didn't want to stand out, I didn't want to be you know, the female pilot. I didn't want to be the female Marine. I didn't want to be the first female anything. I just wanted to be a Marine and serve my country. And I realized, thank you. <laughs> and I've slowly realized that all women really have a responsibility. We have a responsibility for the generation after us to show them the opportunities that they have. You can't I, I, you can hide behind the cloth of I just want to be a Marine. You can hide behind that and that's fine. Um, you can proceed on your career and be successful. However, there is a responsibility to the younger generation. Show them that there are these opportunities. You know, and I'm talking about little girls and little boys because women cannot succeed without the support of men beside them. And that's their cousins, sisters, uh, you, you know, uh, girlfriends, wives, they need the support of their husbands, they need the support of their male counterparts. And so if we teach little boys and we teach little girls, hey, girls can do whatever they want to do. Girls can be a freaking blue angel pilot. That's awesome, you know? <laughs> you know, so I, I think that's what I've seen, at least in the last little bit of my, of my career, is that women do have an obligation. We have an obligation to put a face to a, to a profession that, that is open to, to younger generations. That's great, thank you. All right, so one last question before we open it up to the audience. Uh, uh, kind of as a segue from that, what, was, what has been the best advice given to you in your career that has influenced some of your choices along the way? Admiral? Be yourself. Don't try to be something that you're not because it ain't gonna work. <laughs> Susanna? I got a lot of advice along the years, most of which I cannot repeat. Um, <laughs> the uh, person who trained me as a test pilot was a crusty, tough, exacting guy. Really the kind of person you want to train you. Um, and he rarely gave advice. But one day we were walking off the airplane, I was relatively new. We got back in the office, he looked me square in the eye and he said, you know, Susanna, most of the pilots coming off the airplane never stop and talk to the mechanics and tell them how the day went. You might really want to consider that because that is the person that will save your ass, um, not necessarily the person with the great paperwork. And um, so because he really gave advice, I pondered that really hard. He was absolutely right. Um, over 25 years of flying twice, uh, the mechanic saying to me, you know, it, it all went back together, but you might want to watch out for this. Um, I didn't have a surprise, and I was ready on what to do. So uh, what I got from that really on a much larger scale was that if you're a colleague, a boss, you need to always be available and approachable. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Katie. Well, your answer was beautiful. I don't know how I can follow up that. Um, but I would say the, the most poignant phrase that I was taught, and I always tell high schoolers when I go talk to them, is calm seas don't make a skilled sailor. So what I mean by that is it's the adversity, it's the hard things, it's the obstacles that you face in life that shape you as a person, shape me as an officer, shape me as a Marine. And so it, it's... Um, when you face those obstacles, those hard times in your life, yes, they're difficult to get through, but in the end, you'll be a better person on the back side of it. So calm seas don't make a skilled sailor is my tagline, I guess. <laughs> That's great. All right, so we're gonna open it up to the audience here, and we've got a couple of folks that 
will pass around the mics. Who has a question for someone on our panel? Yes, back here. Hi, welcome. I wanted to know if you guys could give us like that poignant moment where you were up against it, wanted to quit as you were paving the way for the first time. And what was it that got you through it? Um, oh, so I got some, gr a piece of great advice I can repeat, uh, was that, um, it was during my interview for the job, Susanna, you have a reputation for when the going gets tough, you keep going. So of course I say yes, no problem, so now I'm committed. Um, I found the first year in any job where you're the first, which um, for some reason just, I think timing was kind of my whole career is that you just to have to inhale through the first year and keep a great sense of humor um, and decide what's, what you wanna bite on and what you just need to go home and give yourself a pep talk on. Um, my poignant moment was actually humorous in that the air traffic controllers, remember there were no women in this area that were air traffic controllers, there were no mechanics that were controllers or that worked the flight line, and I was the short blonde. So um, the controller typically, when you change frequencies, they would tell all the guys to have a nice day. And that first year to me, they did not. And, th and that stung. Um, so it was like, okay, just wait for it, wait for it. The year rolls kind of we're rolling to the end of the year, and uh, the controller goes to hand me off to the next frequency, and he says, have a nice day, sir. And I thought, oh, I've cracked it, I've cracked it. <laughs> and then, then he's totally discombobulated, and all the guys in the flight deck are looking at me, like, sir? And he goes, I mean, ma'am, I mean, and the controller's totally messed up. I mean, sir, I mean, ma'am, I mean, ma'am, sir. Oh, have a nice day, you know what I mean? My nickname was Ma'am Sir for five years. Okay, well, um, Susanna reminded me of a story. But I, I think I would agree, you know, there are days that you got, you know, there are days that are great days, and, and I love my job, and I've loved what I've done uh, for the past 35 years, or I wouldn't have stuck around this long. But um, I... <laughs> I remember one day I was at sea. I was on the Lexington back when she was our training aircraft carrier, so that dates me, Katie. I'm sure she's been a museum since you were born. Um, <laughs> but we, were, we would tool around in the Gulf of Mexico um, because Lexington couldn't handle seas outside the Gulf of Mexico. But um, So I was the, um, I guess I was the officer of the deck on the bridge, and we were hailing somebody, some traffic that was out there, and nobody could get these guys to come up on the radio. So I got on the radio, Charlie, you're gonna love this. So I got up on the radio and I, I tried to hail this and they go, well, hello, darling, what you doing on that big ship over there? <laughs> And, I, and, and everybody was just laughing hysterically. And so I was, you know, very nautical and very polite to them. They go, well, sure, darling, we'll get out of the way. We'll just come over, you know, right 70 degrees or whatever, and we'll just move on. And so, of course, I got abused over that for the rest of my tour. Um, but, you know, um, sometimes it's an advantage to be a woman on the radio. But uh, I think it's, you know, not every day is a bowl of cherries, and, and you just say, um, I, and I've had some challenges in my career, and you just say, you know, I'm going to muscle through this. And you come out on the other side, and, and I think you're better for it. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question or not, but I'll, I'll pass it off to Katie now. Okay, um, I'm trying to think of a funny story because of those two. I gotta follow that up. Um, okay, so I was in Afghanistan and I was on the Harvest Hawk, which is a C-130 that shoots Hellfires and Griffin missiles. So I did most of my time over there uh, firing CAS missions. Um, so definitely loved that mission because it was um, very intimate with the people on the ground. You knew you were 
helping those Marines and, and, and sailors uh, because they would tell you on the radio after you employed and, and they're no longer getting shot at, things like that. Um, but the other part of that is when they're in the field for months and months and months, they never hear a female voice. And I didn't think that this was a, a thing. I never really thought about being a rarity until I was over there and, and they would specifically request when they would hear filth 02, which is our call sign, to put me on the radio. And I, I never really thought about it. <laughs> and so, um, so I would go back and I was, we call it the sled, which is the sensor and things where you're, you're marking targets and, and firing from in the back. So I was talking to the JTAC or Joint Terminal Air Controller and he was British. And uh, he asked me how I got the call sign Pop-Tart, which that's, <laughs> yeah. So he asked me how I got the call sign Pop-Tart. And before I could answer, the other guy on the radio, on my plane with me, jumps on and says, it was her stripper name before she found Jesus. <laughs> no kidding, no kidding. So I'm sitting there, mouth open, like in shock. Well, what I didn't know is they called me Tart for short. It was just easier. Well, apparently in England, Tart means prostitute. So it made sense to them that that's what my call sign was. So I was on a British base over there. So every time I went into the chow hall, it was like, oh, that's her, that's her, that's her, that's her. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's one of my female stories, but yeah. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. So actually, we are out of time for any additional questions, but that was a great question with great answers. So that's a perfect segue. So uh, what we're going to end the program on uh, is a longstanding tradition that Seafair has had uh, since 1950. And it is uh, with our royalty. We have Queen Elsie on. Unfortunately, our King Neptune is working on the Microsoft Windows 10 launch today. So he gets a pass. But uh, I also have, I'd like to call up here, uh, Miss C. Fair 2015, Nella Kwan. And this longstanding tradition that we have is uh, our royalty. They are, certainly our king and queen are selected uh, because they have made a significant contribution to this region. Uh, they have, have stood out as uh, really individuals who are, are special to where we live. And they have the privilege then along with Miss Seafair to knight individuals in recognition of their contribution. So with that, I would like to call up President Sue so that we can knight her this afternoon. This is such an honor for me because these women are amazing and they're an inspiration to me, so I'm excited. All right. I, Miss Seafair, as a token of my great esteem for you and in recognition of your ability to do honor to the illustrious position, do hereby appoint you a Seafair Royal. Um, Sue, can I have you stand before Queen Alcia? <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Sue is the incoming Rotary president and has recorded two CDs, Even There and Moon Glow. Sue has become a fixture in the local music scene. In addition, she is an accomplished executive with 20 years in brand marketing, radio broadcast, and nonprofit development. Sue, I hereby declare you Supreme Stewardess of Sound and Song. Introducing Supreme Stewardess of Sound and Song. Now please go forth and spread the Seafair message with good cheer and community spirit throughout the Puget Sound. Thank you. <laughs> no, no sound any longer. Thank you. You know what? This is official. 
It, it looks official and it pleases me because in the sixth grade, my sister was Miss Merry Christmas and I've lived in her shadow ever since. So, no longer.